And the way that we've kind of stratified the different levels of airdrop rewards is that you know part of it is skills based and part of it is also engagement and retentions based so it's not just something that you can bot and it's not just something that you can kind of turn on and play a game and then you'll you'll get like a, a massive amount of rewards um because we, we're a skills based pvp game we have our own leaderboards and therefore you know the amount of tokens that you get will be proportional to your 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 play like it's 20 boys on top skill. well i, I really boards. like that idea of like hey it's not just people that provide liquidity. It's not just people that stake. Um, you got to play the game. You got to not just play the game. You got to complete missions in the game. So you can't be passive. And don't just complete missions. You got to be decent at the game. You got to actually commit to learning the meta and, and playing it and doing well and placing on leaderboards. Welcome to 100X Gaming. We are joined by who I was just telling someone feels like the dark horse of Web3 Gaming. Um, I had not even heard about you guys until recently. And the more that I have looked at you, the more that I am like getting very excited about what you're building. This is Nyan Heroes. We've got Max, their CEO and founder. Um, you guys are building a game that seems like one of the most polished things that I have seen in the entire space. Um, and I just found out. I don't know how that's possible. Um, and, and so we've had like our internal ranking lists where we talk about like the games we're most excited about and the ones that could really do something. Um, and then in the last like week, I have put you guys as like my dark horse on my list of like, ooh, I don't know. I don't know that people are expecting someone to come out of left field and just blow everyone's minds. But that might be you guys. So thanks for sitting down with us, Max. I'm really excited to, to talk about your game, to play your game. Um, why don't you introduce the game that you are crafting? Before we dig into everything this episode has to offer, we wanna highlight the awesome partners who sponsor this podcast and make it possible for us to work full-time on 100X. They're legends, and we appreciate them for supporting us. Crypto does not need to be complicated. Cadena is building the human layer of blockchain by giving the power back to the people and allowing them to build products that make a difference for humanity. Founded by ex-JP Morgan and SEC blockchain leads, Cadena develops easy to understand, human readable tools and solutions that focus on the long-term development of the space, not just short-term gains. Simply put, if we want real, regular people to enter and enjoy Web3, Cadena is making a way. To learn more, check out Cadena.io, follow them on Twitter at Cadena underscore IO, or watch our episode with them. RWA is one of the hottest narratives in 2024, and BlockSquare is actively proving why as the tokenization infrastructure provider for real estate. Tokenization changes everything, taking us from a world where a property is transacted once a decade to one where hundreds of transactions of that same asset are executed in moments. Any business can use BlockSquare to digitize the value of properties, launch investment platforms, and connect people to tokenized real estate deals. They've got every tool you need, whether you're a business or you want to participate in RWA through OceanPoint, where they've brought almost 100 properties on chain. To learn more, join their Telegram community and listen to our episode with them in the description below. Astrobit is the king of automated trading, and now they've introduced a freemium model. Put those trading fees to use. How does it work? Sign up to an exchange with one of Astrobit's affiliate links and receive at least 30 free credits as a loyalty bonus. Then earn credits on your trading fees. The more you trade, the more credits you can generate. Use those credits towards trading bots and strategies. In other words, you can create a passive income stream at no cost. Find more deets in the description below. Imagine if Xbox existed without Xbox Live. No way for gamers to play games. No path for developers to find players. That is Web3 Gaming right now. Disjointed, messy, fragmented. Shrapnel has the solution. Built on an AVAX subnet by Mark McCurry, head of blockchain and senior vice president at Consensus, with more than 20 years at Microsoft, this infrastructure, codenamed Bridge, is an all-in-one, modular, multi-chain solution to make Web3 accessible for Web2 devs. What the heck does that mean? It means real games can actually exist in Web3. No more dreaming. Real blockchain gaming is possible because of Shrapnel's codename Bridge. Find out more about Shrapnel and Bridge in the description below. In Web3 gaming, the approaches have essentially been to offer the entire world, fail to deliver, or spend years building an awesome game while you wait. 
Enter a third option, building games on existing platforms and incorporating Web3 mechanics to already huge audiences. Fort Block Games, a US registered company with a fully docs team is doing exactly that. Crafting gaming experiences inside Roblox and Fortnite and launching unique reward system through their FBG token. They're also pioneering an innovative profit share play and earn model. Try out their Roblox release Escape America 2069 right now with their Fortnite release Sunburn Central coming this quarter. To learn more about their current games, the FBG token or the in development competitive shooter, follow the link below. Yeah, no, appreciate it, Matthew. Very happy and excited to be here. Uh, Dark Horse, yeah, I, I can definitely run with that. Uh, we've been building fairly heads down over the last couple of years, so that's probably why. Um, and, you know, we really wanted just to focus on our core product. Uh, and now that we, we have that and we think that it's fairly polished and it's fairly uh, well-developed in comparison to some of the other games that we've seen in the space, uh, really excited to be launching soon on Epic in an early access and hoping to make a splash. Um, but actually, just to go back to introductions, uh, I'm Max. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Nine Heroes. I'm also the creative director. And we are building a AAA hero shooter uh, where small cats pilot giant mechs in, in badass robot suits. And so it's, it's a fairly unique IP. We've been building for the last two years and our vision is to build a flagship shooter uh, for the Web3 space designed to be able to onboard uh, mass gamers. Whether you're in Web2 or Web3, it doesn't really matter. And, and our lens that we've been developing our game through over the past couple of years has been through a traditional game development lens, you know, looking at what uh, game mechanics uh, gamers would be excited by, looking to bring new things into our game and things that people haven't experienced before. And obviously also crafting a unique IP from the ground up and something that, you know, has the potential for mass appeal and uh, broad sort of adoption across multiple diverse target audience groups. Rad. And when you say cats inside of mech shoots, mech suits, it reminds me of a, uh, like, if I look at the graphics, we'll, we'll have some stuff going on so people can see it while we're talking, but it reminds yeah. me of, um, like, Overwatch meets Metroid meets Halo, uh, the early Halos is, is the vibes uh -huh. that I got early on. And that's like all compliments. Those are the games that I grew the early up ones playing. are the best, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the games that I play now. Um, I, yeah. I mostly play shooters. And so it's felt a little bit uh, lacking for me in the Web3 space where most of the games to date haven't been shooters. We've got some really cool ones that are like, it feels like in, in the stages of being playable finally. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I'm getting excited. But yeah, this looks like a game. I know Caesar showed his wife who is a gamer um, and is not into Web3. And I showed my wife who's a gamer who's not into Web3. And we both got a, yeah, we'd play this. We'd play this with you. Um, and most yeah. of the games that I show my wife in Web3, she's not interested in playing <laughs> with me. Um, and there's some good ones. That's not a dig at everyone else. We're really enjoying this space. But the game itself looks really, really solid. It looks really polished. I think that was one of the early questions I asked you when when I first got an, a hold of you was, yep. dude, why the heck is this so polished? Uh, it feels like everything is in pre, 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 pre alpha and mm -hmm. looks like something that I could play right now. Why don't you tell me about like the, uh, the dynamics of like the actual gameplay. So I'm playing the game. Um, what does that look like? Yeah, so it's a, it's a team-based objective shooter first and foremost. So for people familiar with games like Overwatch or Team Fortress where you have two teams on one map and various objectives that you kind of have to take control over. That's our basic game mode. So fairly familiar uh, to, to most players in, in that objective shooter format. Um, the gameplay itself, it, it, we like to make comparisons of, you know, this is like Overwatch and Titanfall had a baby. So, so our core gameplay revolves around this kind of, um, excuse the pun, cat and mouse game where you start out as a mech and, uh, you, you know, when, when you die as a mech, when you get killed, you have this last stand mechanic where you eject as the little cat pilot. Uh, and then you start fighting as the pilot. And there's, there's kind of different dynamics between the mech gameplay and the cat gameplay. Because the mechs, you have your abilities, you have your cool movements, and it's pretty, it's pretty sweaty, it's pretty serious uh, gameplay. But then when you eject as a cat, you kind of, the, the camera kind of changes too. So you become this tiny little this little, you know, cat, 
and, and these mechs a literal cat giants, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know they're towering around you and you feel like this fear and you're you're vulnerable you don't have as much health uh, but you have a different set of abilities compared to your mechs. And uh, you're also agile, so you're really hard to hit. And this is our, our take at our last stand mechanic. And then through various uh, activities as a cat, you'll slowly recharge your mech meter again. And then when it's fully charged, you'll, you'll re-mech and join the fight proper again. And, and the idea is that it's a bit of fun. It's a little bit more accessible as well for the mid to casual gamers who yep. you know don't always want to be in sweaty gun- gunfights, um, and you know it, it's a it's a bit more broadly appealing as well. So that's kind of the the to and fro when it comes to the the actual gameplay itself. And of course, you know we're a hero shooter. We have a ton of awesome abilities, and we also consider ourselves a movement shooter. So you know everyone is in a cat world. So we have all these crazy moves like wall running and double jumping and wall kicking and super leaps. It's all cat inspired. And I know that we're all cat lovers here. Uh, I learned that recently. Caesar has 11 cats. <laughs> You've got... I know. Three. Is that what I, you said? I got five. I, I never would have thought that, you know, there'd be someone out there with more cats than me. Right now um, I have zero. <laughs> but over my whole life, I've had 21 different cats. So Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe boat. you technically win because you've had more <laughs> like in total. Life or just wait, give, give me two collector. years and I might have double or triple. I'm just kidding. I have, I've got kids now, so it's we're in the baby phase. Don't want to worry about animals right now. <laughs> you guys would both know that, um, you know, being cats, they all like to be quite mischievous. They like to compete with each other and jump on high kind of ledges and kind of look down at all the other cats. And this is kind of like a behavior that we've integrated into our movement system. And we've designed our levels with verticality in mind. And that movement kind of, uh, you know, serves that verticality because in gun, you know, shooters, you obviously high ground is a huge advantage over over yep. low ground, and so even that ties in with our cat IP of wanting to be up high, which is which is pretty cool. It wasn't intentional. The the movement mechanic of splitting between or the last stand mechanic reminds me of like Diva from Overwatch. Bring it back to Overwatch, um, yep. a favorite character, I think. You, if you pulled favorite. everyone, that's like 70% of everyone's favorite character, um, which makes <laughs> sense. Having the, the split mechanics just adds another layer of it just being fun. But the thing I was going to say is that movement is what enticed me the most. That first clip you showed me um, the mm. other day, which is, I think it's on your guys' Twitter if people want to look. Yeah. Um, just seeing how quickly you move across the map. It feels like Apex on steroids. Um, mm-hmm. And I think... That's really fun on, on a level like if you're someone that gets into competitive gaming, um, knowing that it's not just aim, knowing that it's not just, I don't know, like Valorant or CSGO where, where aim is the only mechanic that you need to like master yeah. it. There's also a whole nother dynamic of like who can move better than everybody else across yeah. a, a huge field of gameplay. So I think that's going to be a ton of fun. And something that I like a lot. When I did see that that gameplay that you guys posted on the Telegram group that we have, I was like, wow, this really does look really polished. With that in mind, how long have you guys been building this game for? I know you mentioned a couple years. And with that as well, who's the team behind uh, Nyon Heroes? Because to get this game this polished before you guys even launch a pre-alpha, you guys must have an experienced team behind you guys helping you bring this to fruition. Yeah, I appreciate that. We we do have a very experienced team um, but, you know, at the studio. Uh, we've been building for just over two years uh, even though we launched our collection at the end of 2021 this was more of like a community project and it was really just built on a dream um, and we we managed to get some VC funding towards the end of 2021 as well and the studio only actually really came together early 2022 so we've been building for just over two years now uh, you know, and very happy with, with where we're at uh, the studio itself, we got 40, 40 in-house devs. It's fully remote, uh, even though the studio itself was headquartered in Singapore, where I'm at. Um, and yeah, a ton of really experienced devs at the studio. Most people at the studio uh, on the dev side have some kind of AAA background. And when it comes to our leadership team, uh, you know, they're the guys responsible behind titles like Halo, Destiny, Mass Effect, uh, Assassin's Creed. Uh, and and many many more so extremely experienced team and i'm really privileged to to be able to work with them in a creative director capacity where i kind of i kind of feel like a bit of a fraud you know i just kind of sit there and go (laughs) hey we should do all these things and this would be cool and then they go 
Yes, Max, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then like 24 really... hours later, they have it all spun up. I like that. Yeah, well, I mean, this is their bread and butter, right? Like yeah. shooters, um, online PvP games, as well as live service games. This is all within their wheelhouse. They've done it before. They've done it multiple times before. And so, you know, I think that that it kind of shows in in how much we've been able to do in in a relatively short time. You mentioned something earlier when we when we started the conversation that while you guys are when you guys are building this game, you guys have that web two mentality or web two audience in mind first before the web three sort of audience. And that's one of the things that we see a lot of games in this space, unfortunately, get backwards. Their main focus is like, hey, how can we target the web three audience? Because that's generally where they would get their investors or people buying their NFT collections. But if we're going to reach the masses, if we're going to get the average player, if we're going to get my wife and Matthew's wife to play this game. It has to really feel like any Web2 game that they would pick up in the Epic Game Store or on the PlayStation Store and things like that. What does that look like for you guys when you guys have that Web2 mentality? What kind of decisions differ and when you're not focusing on that Web3 people or that Web3 player first? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a tough question. Um, uh, but I would say that, you know, actually, whilst we do have that Web2 mentality and that outlook, it's it's kind of doubly hard in Web3 because because you kind of need to do both well. You have to serve your Web2 gaming community in, in a meaningful way. But at the same time, you know, we're building in Web3, so we have to be able to serve that community as well. And that community is also awesome in, in a different way. You know, it's full of DJs and, and the meme culture is strong. And, uh, you know, we have to be able to hit both in order to succeed. Um, we feel that you know, a lot of the hardest things to do are on the Web2 side, to create something that's truly unique, something that's built from the ground up with unique gameplay mechanics that really speak to, you know, true gamers. And so that's where we focused a lot of our efforts over the last couple of years. Um, so when it comes to making decisions, I mean, one of the first things that we do is say, okay, well, what is, what is our vision not? And that is, we're not going to copy an existing game and reskin it. You know, that's that's kind of like step one. Uh, we're not going to take things that have been done before and kind of just do an asset flip. We're not going to, you know, put together a bunch of plugins and then get some store-bought assets and ship it. You know, none of those things are what we're about. We're, you know, we're building a, a unique IP from scratch. And we're also building all these unique gameplay systems from the ground up, ultimately because our vision is something that's long-term. And, you know, we're, we're not here to make a quick buck. You know, we've grinded through the bear. We had a lot of ups and downs. And, you know, we've shown that we're fairly resilient and we're committed to the cause. And so, you know, I think that is what I'm most proud of. And a lot of that also uh, credit goes to the studio itself as well. You know, we've got a bunch of great people. We work really well together. And there's just a, a great sense of team teamwork and camaraderie. Um, I have a question just while we're still on the point of like how you uh, tap into these audiences. Um, mm -hmm. Esports. I don't remember where on your stuff that I saw that like esports is going to be important yep. to you guys. And as someone who like gets very into the competitive side of games while not being like, I'm not a professional esport player. I know I, most games I play well, I'm like in the 1%. But the difference between the 1% and the 0.01% is the esports. And I'm not up there. I'm not casual but not a pro. Um, yeah. And so I see both worlds um, and I really like getting involved with the competitive side, but I also see how that at times pushes out the casual side. Um, mm -hmm. And you get games like you referenced Halo that are like peak casual shooters um, that do have com competitive MLG scenes, but, but peak casual shooter that like dads are just turning on their Xbox and playing that game every night. Um, but then on the flip side, you've got games like Valorant that are designed for a purely competitive experience. I'm curious, where do you guys fit in that dynamic? Uh, I would say, you know, we do get a lot of inspiration from Overwatch. Uh, you know, we have our own unique mechanics that are completely separate, of course. Uh, but, you know, one of, I grew up playing shooters as well. And I still remember when I was in high school, when the first Overwatch dropped. And honestly, I sometimes wish that I could go back to those days because Overwatch 1 was a phenomenon. Like it took over, uh, it took the world by storm and a bunch of me and my friends, we all loved it so much. And the great thing that I think Overwatch did 
you know, back in its glory days, uh, is that it had a really good skill curve that, that enabled, you know, even just casual players, players playing for the first time to get into the game and feel like they were contributing no matter what role they played uh, and no matter how good they were. That's something that uh, League of Legends does well as well. It's, it's got a great onboarding for new players and casual players, but obviously it's got a very deep uh, you know, learning curve as well. And, and the more you play, the more you, you learn, you can, you can get up into the really high kind of skill capped uh, player, players uh, and, and tiers. So that's our goal. Uh, you know, we're still early days, obviously. I'm not going to go out here and say that we've developed that, uh, you know, depth of skill curve, yeah, you know, already. Curve. <laughs> but, but that is our goal, yeah. Do you see, as far as, like, esports goes, do you see you guys building your own esports scene, or do you think that's going to be something that's more community-driven? We'd love to have a mix, honestly. Uh, you know, there's, there's going to be some stuff where I think we start from from grassroots. I think... That is a lot of the ethos as well behind Web3 and, and community building and kind of building from the ground up. I definitely want to do that. And that, and that is part of our uh, plans and in our roadmap. But at the same time, you know, I grew up watching esports as well. And I, I still watch esports. I still follow them. Yeah, we, I mean, that's like regular. On, on the weekends, that's uh, some people have their TV playing. In our house, yeah. we're watching some esports on Twitch. <laughs> that's awesome because the, it's, it's, it's the same as me. And there is like this sense of passion about, you know, players who are competing at the highest level and they're creating their own stories, right? Their own journeys. And obviously, you know, League of Legends is like all about Faker, right? But, you know, he, like that story is just insane and incredible. And I think, you know, whilst we definitely want to start at the grassroots, we, we also want to have that top-down uh, narrative in esports as well, where the peak you know, the pinnacle of players can kind of come together and craft their own sort of like champion stories. Um, and, you know, that that's something that is is a dream. Um, and again, it's also quite far away, but, uh, yeah. you know, definitely working towards that. <laughs> I dig that. I don't know if you ever followed, um, and maybe this is a hot take to my esports gamers out there. I felt like my favorite, like, peak esports gaming moment was the rise up to the Fortnite World Cup um, okay. And that was that was driven by Epic. Like they threw millions and millions of dollars at like, let's just find whoever the best players are in every single region of the world and bring them yep. together. And a battle royale, which was a new genre at the time, had like had never done that. And that was wild to watch those stories develop of these players that were nobodies who are now yep. like a lot of those guys. I mean, look at Song. You know, I think he was second place at World Cup, and he's one of the creative directors at Magic Eden now. Um, and is and is working in the the Web three gaming esports scene, um, and you've got these guys who have been superstars. Some of them switched over to Valorant and are some of the best Valorant players in the world. Never would have happened um, if there wasn't that top down support from Fortnite. And so I do see, um, and I use Fortnite as an example because I nerded over that for a long time. Um, but I do think that support of like building an ecosystem and then letting the players tell their stories is a lot of fun. Go ahead, Caesar. I was going to say with when you talk about the competitive scene, it's hard to look at just any competitive game today without talking the pro about the problem of cheating. I can't I don't even play Warzone anymore just because I got tired of the the cheaters. It's sometimes in Apex, thankfully, it's gotten a little bit better. But sometimes I can just even grind to try to get to Masters or Predator because cheaters are just rampant at the top levels. How do you guys and that's something that we haven't seen in Web3 yet, just because games are so early in their development. Cheating is probably one of the, the, the last things people are thinking about right now because it's still so far away. But I mean, even now when you see like tournaments for these pre alphas well, we saw that in shrapnel there wasn't yeah. a lot like a lot of it was just bad players complaining sorry if you're one of the bad <laughs> players compa complaining but they did see i remember they put out an announcement they saw a little bit of a uh, movement hacks um or where where people were moving at super speed that was intentional those people got banned they didn't get the leaderboard access um but yeah i mean that's like the first big event we've seen in web3 gaming and cheaters showed up it wasn't rampant like warzone but they were there and and that's and that's the thing, right? Like in in Web two, the games they don't have any economic incentive to cheat. You throw in thousands of dollars for leaderboard competitions or esport things where there's tokens involved and NFTs and things that they can actually sell for. Now that's a bigger incentive for them to actually go find a way to try to get an advantage over everyone. How do you guys plan to handle that if you guys are thinking about that already? Yeah, I mean cheating is rampant, right? Across all verticals of games, you could have 
you know, the most casual game and there'll still be cheaters. Um, you know, this, this is something that we are definitely thinking about. Uh, e even in our upcoming release, uh, we have integrated uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I believe it's, it's uh, unreal sort of anti-cheat. Uh, obviously, it, it's still early days for us. Um, just like, uh, you know, the, the guys at Trapnel. And obviously, you know, we have to make sure that we adapt uh, with the industry and make sure that we're using best practices for cheating. When it comes to Web3, uh, you know, cheating in Web3, yeah, there's a lot of financial incentive behind it for sure. And I think one of the, uh, you know, ways that we can, I guess, mitigate this is just with with harsh pun punishments, right? Because... If if you do cheat in Web two, you get your account banned. You know, no big deal. In Web three, you know, you're likely a player that has assets. You know, you're probably got a ton of minted items on your account, and you're trying to participate in this kind of Web three flywheel. And then you, you're trying to cheat and game game the system and get more points by you know performing well on PvP ladder. But ultimately, the the best and strongest deterrent is just banning the account. And in doing so, you lose everything that you, you essentially have been you know trying to trying to slowly accumulate and so in that way you know we hope that that can act as some some kind of deterrent um but honestly like the 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 rise of cheating in games or i guess it's been around for a while is just it's so insidious it's really hard to get rid of and, and you mentioned games like apex right there's there's things that are kind of on the edge you know, it's in the gray area and you don't really know, like, is this a cheat or is it not a cheat? Because players are using these custom configs, right? I'm not sure, yep. you know, if, if you guys having to, you know, if you guys do that or not, but like there are custom configs, which are insane. You, you can tap strafe, whatever you like. There's custom convicts that completely remove your recoil, depending on whatever primary weapon that you, you have equipped. And it's just, there's, I know there's also custom configs that do allow um, hot swapping of your evo shield like instantly you don't you don't even have to do anything um like is that cheating or not like you know initially i think it is. Configs were, <laughs> well, I, I think it is too i mean at that point those yeah, are exploits, exploits right for sure i mean it depends on the game fortnite defines those as as exploits and bans top pros over that kind of stuff yeah yeah it's it's interesting because i, I think the apex scene they've kind of been a bit more lenient on that but now it's getting to the point where it's like well this is really just very egregious kind of behavior where you would not expect any of these people to actually be able to do these things and they're providing massive advantages. So, yeah, I mean, it's a tough cookie to, to kind of crack this one. But all we can do is say that, you know, we, we are committed to, to, you know, ensuring that we are up to date with the industry practices and we'll, we'll do whatever we can. We'll try and create, you know, strong deterrence away from cheating, especially on the Web3 side where money is involved. When, when you mentioned one of the strong deterrents that you guys plan on adding, because that's one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, with Web2, you can get your account banned, even go as far as having an IP ban, which is like, okay, how do you go around that when your IP is banned? With Web3, I've always thought like, well, sure, they can close down your 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 sort of account, but the whole idea of Web3 and decentralization is I own my assets. So can't I just go ahead and take those assets and send them to a new wallet and start a new account through there? Or is there a way that since you guys control the NFTs that you guys can say, hey, NFT 795 has been found cheating. We're just not going to allow that NFT to be used for gameplay anymore. Is that as far as you guys can take it? Or is that not possible because yeah, they actually own the asset? Yeah, I guess that that is an option. Uh, our, our kind of backend blockchain architecture that we're kind of thinking around right now, it actually, for now, the, the working uh, thesis is that it, it's kind of more like a centralized exchange where we have our centralized servers we also have our studio wallet that manages all the uh all the nft and in, in sort of like minted items in game and so players who wish to take their assets outside of the game they can transfer it from our studio nft wallet to their own personal wallet and they can trade it on the open marketplace or whatever but when they're playing the game and when they're getting involved in our flight you know in our in our reward systems and things like that that asset actually has to be transferred over to the studio where we have we have escrow over that asset and so, so you board if, it if in in comes... order to use it in game then if yeah. i cheat you can just lock it in that studio so wallet it. and i lose access to it yeah cool so nfts are tradable on the open market but to play the game with them yeah they have to be implemented into the ecosystem and that yeah. gives you the ability to, right. to deal with cheaters that's interesting yeah that's a 
I didn't even think about that. Good question, Caesar. That's a whole new dynamic of how do you deal with with uh, <laughs> cheaters when the whole point of Web three is is ownership. I was just going to say, like C- Caesar's proposal as well around sort of like um, blacklisting that NFT. That's also a viable option if you don't have like if if you're giving players custody uh, of those assets and they're kind of connecting via a wallet and then they're getting that asset in the game and there's no sort of studio wallet behind. That, it's a viable solution. I know that. Even um, NFTs that were kind of, I think when when uh, those sort of zero commission marketplaces came around and then people weren't kind of respecting the, the royalty enforcement um, protocols, then projects could kind of like blacklist those those NFTs that were traded without royalty. So, you know, it is a viable solution. Talking about NFTs, uh, let's talk Web3, crypto, blockchain, the whole shebang. Um, why are you guys building a game? in Web3 and not just launching on Steam or Epic um, entirely and, and doing what everyone else has done for the last 20 years? The simple answer uh, would be ownership. You know, I've, I kind of grew up playing, uh, you know, trading card games as well. I, I was a big fan of Magic, uh, The Gathering. This was the core vision that got us all started in the first place uh, at, at Neon Heroes. It wasn't about the, the financial aspect at all. Um, it wasn't about just you know putting NFTs or, or tokens in the game for for no reason. The fundamental difference that blockchain offers is self custody and ownership of your assets, and that is something that as a gamer myself, I do feel is underappreciated if you're if you're not really thinking about it. So as I said, I, I used to play a lot of trading card games, and I used to buy so many packs. Uh, and ultimately, no matter what happens, you know to this day I still own those cards. Um, and that, for better or worse, is a, is a uh, you know, sometimes I reminisce and I, and I go, yeah, this is awesome. I still have those cards and I still, you know, appreciate them. Um, so, so, so that's one thing. The other thing is, um, you know, being a gamer, obviously, it's hard to avoid, uh, you know, those kind of gacha-like games, uh, in, in, especially in mobile. Um, I'm a big sucker for them, to be honest. I, I do spend... Uh, you know, I have spent uh, a decent amount of money in those kind of like gacha games. And, you know, I kind of got a bit sick of it. Uh, I kind of got a bit uh, fatigued with, with those yeah. gacha games. And now when I see a gacha game and it's, you know, by, by you know, like a, a Asian company that you know is going to try and milk you for all your money, you kind of think, well, is it worth it? Like, do I really want to buy all these things? Do I really want to roll for these assets that ultimately... I don't own Nothing. and probably in three to six months, I'm not even going to play anymore. Um, and my usual answer these days is no, I'm not going to bother doing that because, you know, there's, there's little value in that and they're just going to milk me for a short period of time and, and that's it. So I think for me, it's the core thesis behind as a gamer, when I'm paying for assets, I feel like I should own them. And, you know, you've heard all the things about Ubisoft just like, hey... Uh, you know, players should get used to not owning that. <laughs> so it's like, come on, man. No, dude, we're going the other direction. You yeah. guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes me think about, I was, and this I'm, maybe isn't too much of a dig, but I was really, really into a game called Rogue Company for a while. It did not get oh, super yeah? popular, but it was a hero yeah. shooter. Um, mm-hmm. It was on Epic. Uh, and I, like, I got all in. I bought everything. Um, and then they made, like the studio, made some pretty big pivots in the way that the gameplay worked. Um, and it just wasn't for me anymore. Like they went from being a very tactical based hero shooter, which felt like a unique dynamic because you didn't really mm-hmm. have like the one tap, uh, fast, quick paced gameplay of like CS go of like, it's just over instantly and hero shooters blended together. Usually it was like, you're a bunch of tanks and hero shooters. So it was something totally unique and I got really into it. Um, and then they switched the entire game around after I had spent a bunch of money, I stopped playing. The game I don't really think exists anymore. Their player base is like 2,000 people now. Um, so clearly everyone else felt the same way that I did, but it's over for me. Like I spent, I bought every hero. I bought every character. I'm, and and they, they monetized it the same way that you would talk about like those gotcha mobile games where it's like you were spending money on every individual thing. Um, and I played that a ton with my friends and my wife was really into it. And so that was like, yeah, that was a worthwhile spend. But it sucks that... After we played it for a year and then it was just done. It's gone. All my money's wasted. I don't own anything. Um, and that's actually, I think when you get gamers making games, we're seeing this um, because you've been in the same boat. 
And I think when I first heard about the idea of blockchain games, that was the very first thing that I thought was that or like the number of skins that I wasted money on in Fortnite, like probably hundreds of them. Um, and so doesn't matter. I don't own any of it. Like they could turn their servers off tomorrow. The same way that Warzone did that, right? People spent yep. thousands of dollars on Warzone, Warzone 1 skins, and then they just shut the servers down, deleted everyone's skins, deleted everything everyone ever bought, and then 48 hours later launched Warzone 2, which was the exact same thing. The same servers, everything. They just deleted all your stuff you bought to drive you to buy new stuff. Um, that is such a scummy practice and it would be solved if you just owned your assets. Yeah, that makes sense. What in, in regards to like what specifically is on chain for you guys? Um is that when we when we talk assets, is that going to be like heroes, is that skins, is that weapons, is that tokens, is that NFTs? Like what goes into being on chain? Yeah, it's uh so so the way that our system works is that obviously we want to be uh, we want to have a seamless experience and we want to kind of abstract away all the web three elements from for web two gamers. So when they are on board, they don't, they don't need an NFT. They don't need anything. They play for free. And when they're going through the game loops and they're collecting, you know, various things like self currency and materials and they're crafting gear and then, you know, unlocking characters, all these things are just traditional uh, web two game assets. And if they, if they don't want anything to do with the web three side, they hate web three guts you know they don't have to they don't have to do anything on that side if they don't want to and they can go around the the game loop perfectly perfectly normal cool um the things that we're allowing to to transition from web 2 assets into web 3 assets through a process that we're calling awakening uh which is essentially our our version of minting are going to be the characters themselves the mods uh, that attach to the character. So each character has several slots that you can attach mods Got to, it. which give you... So you can you, customize uh, your characters. Is that like abilities? You can customize. Or is that uh, they're more like looks. passive passive cool. elements, but one slot will have an active ability, which will uh, be quite interesting. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the mod system in um, Warframe, but, it, you know, something similar yeah. to that. They actually have quite a good, um, like, in-game marketplace as well. So, you know, quite, quite interesting for us. Um, so it's the characters, it's the mods that can, they, they can both be awakened. And then the, NF, the, the skins uh, will be NFTs as well. The, the skins are actually unique in that they're uh, NFTs off the bat. Um, cool. It's just that traditional players, they won't need to mint them. They're just automatically NFTs. And through our studio uh, backend wallet, you know, we just assign them to the flip, but they, they, don't, they don't see anything different on the front end. So if, if they wanted to, that's to me, that's like the easiest access point for a, a regular gamer to, to get to know about crypto. So, yeah. hey, I got this skin. Don't really want it anymore. I, I ran this for a long time. It was my main skin. I got something else. This is just sitting here. Wait, I can sell this? I can trade this? Um, do you guys, are you going to have your own like marketplace? Yeah. You mentioned your studio wallet. Is that all going to be in-house? Are you going to use something like Magic Eden? It's going to be in house, uh, our our marketplace. It's going to be first party, so players won't actually have to leave the game in order to trade uh, P two P. So that's that's the ultimate goal. And in that marketplace, because we we not only have our traditional servers that are holding all our all our data and our items, but also the studio wallet. Um, that's that they're both kind of talking to each other in the back end. Uh, when players trade in our marketplace, you'll see that. Some items will just be the regular items and then other ones will be earmarked with like Awaken next to it. And so both of them will be able to transact in the same interface. With this idea in mind of like sort of abstracting a lot of the Web3 aspects for people who are just joining the game and maybe don't know it's a Web3 game and they're just playing, having fun. How do you bring that introduction to like, hey, by the way, this skin that you have, this skin that you're not looking to, you're no longer using, you can actually go ahead and trade that on our marketplace. How do you make that introduction to like, hey, this is actually Web3 and this is what an NFT is like and this is why it has value. Are you there to make that sort of introduction to players that never heard it? Do you already expect them to have some sort of knowledge? What is that like? The, the players don't need to come with any uh, pre-existing knowledge of Web3 at all. And our goal is not necessarily to, to shove it down their throats and say, hey, you know, you're, you're playing this game and actually it's a Web3 game and actually, 
you know, the, the web two items, they suck and you have to awaken them into web three items for them to be, to be good. Like it's, there's no power difference or there's no mm. functional difference between a web two and a web three item. So in that way, what, what we want to do is we want to create this sort of organic curiosity, I would say, because as players are transacting in our marketplace, they'll naturally see that there are some, you know, regular items and they'll also see in the marketplace, oh, there are these like awakened items. Like what, what's this? And they'll say, well, why, why are the awakened items trading at like such a high premium compared to the regular items? Like, what's that about? Like, what do you actually have to do to awaken them? And it's just through exposure, a gradual exposure, and then kind of, I guess, relying on their own personal curiosity about uh, if they're interested in marketplaces, you know, some gamers love in-game marketplaces. They like to actually trade around it and, and make a bit of money through it. it you know, it, it is definitely possible. And so if that kind of Web2 gamer looks at this marketplace and sees this price differential and they've got a bit of a more financial mindset, they'll get naturally curious about well, what are these awakened items? And then, you know, we'll have, uh, you know, tutorials uh, that people can actually go to. It's an opt-in that, that actually show them, okay, well, this is what an awakened item is. This is how you actually create awakened item. This is the benefits of having awakened items. Um, but it's completely opt-in. It's not in your face. It's not part of the onboarding experience. It's just something that we have that, you know, if, if players are interested, they'll naturally go there. So it's the same way that like, if am I the type of person that would want to mod my items? If not, use the items that are not awakened. If I do want to mod them and I want to tinker with it, and I want to mess around and I want to super customize, now I'm going to stumble into the wonderful world of NFTs. Yeah. I was going to add to that to that sort of question. With you guys launching on the Epic Game Store, what's that conversation like when you talk to Epic? Like, hey, we're actually going to have our own marketplace. I know they're trying to be open-minded about the Web3 aspect of things and, and have like sort of disclaimers on their games that have anything to do with NFTs and blockchain. How are you guys dealing with that? Are you guys actually going to be able to make those transactions inside the game or will players need to sort of go to a website and then exit out of the Epic Games sort of store to actually go interact with these NFTs? Yeah, so at the moment, um, Epic Games are actually quite open when it comes to games with, with you know Web3 components to them. The only uh, requirement is that there is no direct purchase of, of any of these web3 elements through the the game through the through the epic platform any purchase or any any transaction has to be third party which either means a marketplace or your own website um, but as far as the game experience goes uh, as you know as long as there's no direct purchases then then they're completely fine with it having uh, web3 components um, you know via via a different platform so in that way i would say they're quite progressive and, and it's obviously been very helpful and we see a lot of web3 games launching there as the first kind of dis distribution platform the the goal is that obviously we want our users to be able to transact um natively uh, in our game not only web2 items traditional game items but also nfts um this is probably going to take some time and so we are ready with our product in sort of, you know, kind of launching with, with, with two different versions where one has all that, that trading in it. And that, that's probably going to be either on Web3 game distribution platforms or our own, you know, uh, our own download uh, through our own website. And, and then the ones that are on like Epic or Steam, for example, they won't, they won't have that. They'll just have the Web2 uh, components. Cool. That makes sense. Um, and then token, where does the token play in with, cause you guys are going to have a token. So where does that play in with NFTs? Like how does that interact with the economy you're creating? So, so our tokens are an upfront purchase that our uh, web three users have to make in order to actually awaken or mint these, these traditional assets into their uh, web three counterparts, their awakened forms. Um, and so there is an upfront cost uh in in doing that and that is where part of the demand will, will come from uh so players that are interested on the web3 side they'll, they'll pay for our nian token they'll use it and it'll get spent in order to uh mint uh, an, an awakened asset and then they'll take that awakened asset they'll equip it to their character they'll, they'll play with it in game and that'll grant them access to the NFT gated rewards pool, which you know is just basically a, for, a collection of various you know emission, token emissions, rewards programs, staking, a bit of yield, uh, and additional rewards from things like uh, you know seasonal leaderboards and esports competitions, you know grassroots included. 
Um, and so that that is the token that is directly spent in order to access that uh, loop. The great thing about our game is that you know we have integrated traditional monetization pathways for regular gamers, and so you know they they buy our premium currency called catnip, which is off chain. It's the same thing as like diamonds or crystals, and anything that they do with those with those catnip that they buy, uh, they can spend it on battle passes, they can spend it on skins, they can spend it on boosting their account progression. That goes into studio revenue, and a portion of that studio revenue is dedicated to buybacks of our ecosystem token, which is why no matter what, even if you're a Web2 gamer or Web3 gamer, you're still contributing to that monetary inflow for demand for our ecosystem token through the buybacks. In addition, we have marketplace trading fees as well. Half of them will be diverted into studio revenue. Half of them will be converted after the fact into Nian token, providing further sort of buy, buy to side demand uh, for that token. Cool. And then you, you have things like staking and governance as well, providing additional incentives. You mentioned a couple of the, the things that of your ecosystem that are actually going to be on chain. You have the NFTs, uh, sort of the awaken items, and then the, the the neon token that's also going to be on chain. Are there any other aspects of the game? I know you mentioned that you have your own centralized servers. Is any part of the game actually going to be living on chain? And you guys are actually using Solana for that, right? Yeah, we're we're building on Solana at the moment, but we're not we're not um, you know tied to any particular chain. Our, our thesis is you know we we we're going to be chain agnostic, and essentially. Uh, the goal behind that is we don't want to we don't want to segment uh, or, or alienate gamers that want to use a particular chain, and you know we want to go wherever they want to go, and that's totally fine. Um, in terms of are there any game elements? Ooh, this is a tricky one that are going to be on chain for us. This is definitely you know I know there are a lot of on chain games out there, and you know kudos to them. They're they're definitely you know yeah we have Pirate Nation on the podcast. They're completely on chain. Yeah, um, which is and which is awesome. That are- not on chain at all besides skins and then we've had people that are in the middle yeah so we're definitely on the the i guess you know the the left side of that spectrum where you know our our awakened items and our skins and our tokens are going to be on chain but when it comes to things like game logic uh no that that's going to be uh centralized and and web 2 for now cool that makes sense um i'm curious you guys pushed uh, you were originally, maybe push is the wrong word. Originally, you guys were launching your token that we were just talking about in 2022. You delayed that, uh, bear market, whatever. Um, and then you guys are teasing uh, the token launch this year. Can you tell me about what that looks like? Yeah, well, I uh, can definitely talk to uh, the past. And then when it comes to the future, uh, I well, I'll have to be a little vague on, on the timings. But yeah, we I think we had a, a video that came out back way back in 2022, and, and it said something like IDO uh, May 2022. I think, you know, for everyone that was here back in May 2022, we know what else happened in May 2022, uh, which was, uh, you know, a four-letter word starting with L, ending with UNA. <laughs> um, that kind of, you know, kind of hit the boat the wrong way. And it was literally, it, it happened a week before we were planning on, on doing our, our token launch. And as soon as it started happening, we were just like, oh my God, we can't, we can't launch right now. I mean, firstly, it would be pretty, um, you know, um, tone deaf to, yeah. to launch a token whilst the market is kind of crashing, but also like, you know the market's the market's crashing. It's it's not a good environment for a token launch. And then, you know, things just ha- kept happening one after the other. It was three arrows. It was actually, one of our original uh, seed investors, three arrows. Okay. Um, they kind of went under as well. And so we were like, oh man. And then, you know, Celsius, BlockFi didn't stop. And then FTX Alameda, also another one of our investors. They they went belly up, and so it just didn't end, and we couldn't did really that hurt find you guys like losing or having multiple investors go belly up, or or did that like did that impact you guys? I don't know how that worked. Thankfully, on a from a financial perspective, it didn't because um, you know we kind of got the investment, and we also thankfully didn't keep it on. Uh, you know, uh, we 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 had self custody of, of those funds. Um, basically ever since we got them. So we didn't have any on Celsius or BlockFi or uh, I think, what was the other one? Silicon Valley. 
um, or FTX. And I think Three Arrows also did uh, some treasury management, so we didn't park it with them either. So we were very lucky in that none of those things happened to affect us. Um, <laughs> so that's why yes. it is important to have self custody of your self custody, not, not your, your keys, keys, not your keys. Not your crypto, not your crypto. Yeah. Damn. That's the biggest example that we've probably seen in this space. Sometimes I feel like, you know, there was a guardian angel uh, watching over us because, you know, basically everyone that uh, went belly up had some kind of involvement with, with our projects in some way, shape or form. And we were just so kind of lucky to be able to avoid it all. So I don't know. I think, you know, someone someone is looking out for us. And so maybe it's a sign. That makes sense. So you didn't launch your token. You didn't launch. Uh, very reasonable decision. Um, <laughs> timeline is less concerning to me. Um, do you guys plan on launching like this year? Um, what does that launch look like? Are you, you, we can clip this. If not, are you doing the airdrop? Like, are you allowed to talk about the airdrop? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I, that I'm, would, I'm, that's like the most unique way that I've even heard of anyone doing an airdrop campaign. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I know that there's it's there's a, there's a lot of um, other airdrops happening or due to happen, uh, particularly in the gaming space, and so you know, I, I definitely think that there's a bit of a meta going on at the moment for gaming yeah. airdrops, and everyone is know, airdropping. It feels like 2021 with like whitelist being how you invested. Yeah. Right now, it's airdrops. Yeah. For sure. And obviously, you know, from our end, we'd love to do something, you know, super unique. But at the same time, I do think it's a good, it's a decent vehicle um, for not only rewarding our most loyal holders and the people that have been part of our community for so long, uh, but also rewarding people who actually just play the game. And the way that we've kind of stratified the different levels of airdrop rewards is that you know part of it is skills based and part of it is also engagement and retentions based so it's not just something that you can bot and it's not just something that you can kind of turn on and play a game and then you'll you'll get like a, a massive amount of rewards um because we, we're a skills based pvp game we have our own leaderboards and therefore you know the amount of tokens that you get will be proportionate to your 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 play like it's sweaty boys on top exactly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I really like that idea of like, hey, it's not just people that provide liquidity. It's not just people that stake. Um, you got to play the game. You got to not just play the game. You got to complete missions in the game. So you can't be passive. And don't just complete missions. You got to be decent at the game. You got to actually commit to learning the meta and, and playing it and doing well and placing on leaderboards. Like all of that to me is like, I'm someone that maybe this is like not a healthy trait, but I'm definitely someone that like you just throw quests and rewards at me and I will obsess over that gameplay loop. Um, You're a completionist. I, like, I, I am the, yes, I am the the completionist that is, that is probably the reason why some of the gaming industry is so toxic because I just eat it up. Um, but to me, that makes it feel way more exciting. Like I... I think I've sometimes struggled to get like obsessed about airdrop campaigns because it feels like really, I'm just going to like sit here and process transactions and press my thumbprint on my wallet over and over and over again to just like swap fees back and forth. But when it's like, dude, just come play our game. That is mm -hmm. way more exciting to me. That is something that I can, can get behind. So I think that's rad. Do you guys have a rough timeline of when you want to push that out? Uh, next month. It's gonna start oh, next month. All right, yeah, so that's way yeah. <laughs> really <Okay>. soon. <laughs> yeah, a couple of weeks actually. Yeah. Cool. So airdrop and, campaign. And for anyone who actually wants to participate in that campaign, do they need to do anything? Do they need to sign up through your website? Do they need to have a Genesis NFT of some sort? What would someone looking to participate in that campaign and then that yeah, drive? If we want to participate, to how do we do that? <laughs> I mean, th th there's no barrier to entry. So all you have to do is uh, sign up on our website. We have a pre-registration. Uh, uh, button at the moment where you can pre-register your interest. Uh, but when the airdrop campaign actually starts, you just go to our website, you log in using your Twitter handle, and then you can just start earning points by doing missions. Uh, we don't force anyone to, to own an NFT necessarily. You can do missions and you can get points even without any, any of our collections. Uh, but of course, if you have the collections, um, you know, you get additional points and you get additional multipliers. And obviously for people in our community that have been holding for long periods of time, we're going to give them even more, uh, bonuses how much are your, as... uh, how much are those Genesis NFTs right now? Are they trade? Do you have your own marketplace? Is that magic Eden? Where are those at? 
the the highest activity is I believe it's on Tensor or and Magic Eden, the, both of those marketplaces. So you sort know of the four prices. Growth. Oh god, I I don't check often, but I believe it's something like two point five Sol. So cool. you know, it's it's a couple uh, two hundred and fifty dollars I think now yeah. with Sol being around a hundred. Um, so it's not it's not you know inaccessible by any stretch of the imagination, but obviously it's not it's not the same as like an entry level uh you know nft you can get for you know 10 20 dollars yeah cool yeah that makes sense and it's cool that you're not locking it that that anyone can participate um i really just have one more question and we'll show some gameplay uh at some point in this if you're listening um i really just have one more question and that is simply like where should people go to get involved i mentioned at the beginning that my first reaction to seeing it was your twitter manager whoever your socials guy is props to him (laughs) reached out to us um, and I clicked on your profile and I thought, legitimately, why have I not heard about these guys? This game looks right up my alley. I look like the ideal uh, player that, yeah, this looks sick. Like, I genuinely think it looks really good. Um, I want to get involved. I want to play the game. Um, I'm following you guys everywhere now. I'm in your Discord. I'm on your socials. What is the best place for someone that maybe they're listening? This is their, like, dark horse moment. They're being introduced to you guys. Where is the best place for them to get involved in? Airdrops are coming up. Alpha play tests are coming up. Um, should they follow a specific social? Should they get involved in a specific way? What does that look like? I mean, you're doing all the right things. Um, we, we're most active on Twitter and Discord. So, you know, follow our Twitter, join our Discord. That's where you'll hear the most latest uh, information uh, around our upcoming airdrop and our upcoming play test. Uh, if you really want to min-max your points, you know, check us out on Magic Eden or Tensor Marketplace and grab yourself like an, uh, at least like an entry-level NFT because you'll, you'll get some pretty significant uh, multiplier bonuses cool. over the course of the airdrop campaign. Uh, but otherwise, you don't have to. Uh, you can just uh, follow all our socials. And when we start kicking off our campaign uh, early next month, um, yeah, just sign up via the website and, and start collecting points. We're calling the points meows. So you're actually collecting meows um, throughout the course of the campaign. So, uh, you know, rank up on your meow point system. And then uh, at the end of it all, we'll wrap it up and we'll we'll deliver our, our eco token through the wallet addresses that you signed up with. Sweet. Awesome. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you for listening. I should say, um, just a disclaimer, we have no financial incentive as of now to... Uh, to do this episode, we weren't paid anything. I probably will hold one of the NFTs by the time this episode releases. So take that into account. Maybe I'm biased. Um, but yeah, don't don't take this as financial advice. If you are someone named Gary Ginsler, uh, that's not our goal. We're talking about cool games. Um, we like cool games. And that's exactly what you guys are building. I'm excited to check out the airdrop campaign. I'm excited to play the game. Um, and we'll probably put some gameplay content out there pretty soon for you guys. So thank you, Max. Thank you. Neon Heroes, I think I said that right. Less, yep. less like a white guy. Well, good. Um, <laughs> this has been a blast, man. I'm, I'm genuinely really excited to try your game. I think you quickly rose to like the short list of games that I most want to play. So congrats. Your, your work is being recognized. Years <laughs> uh, building with your head down. And I can't wait to see you guys get some players on here. This is going to be rad. Appreciate it, guys. You know, thank you for having me on the show. It's been awesome. I really enjoyed the questions, some of them uh, tougher than others. Uh, And looking forward to your updated uh, tier list. I don't know if you guys are going to do like a little tier list. Maybe we should drop one on social media. Oh, I mean, not posted a tier list, but I think you you're creeping your way into the top right now. It's a missed opportunity because tier lists are like massive engagement farms. Because it's true, they just piss everybody off, and I try so hard to be kind. (laughs) I feel this is what it is. I feel bad when I like dunk on something that I don't really care about, but I'm like, dude, I know you poured your just life into making that, and I'm going to tell you that it's like a D. I just feel terrible <laughs> saying that, but <laughs> well, I mean, you could do. I saw one person at literally like 150 games, and they were all S or A tier, and I was like, "There is no way they're all S or A <laughs> yeah, tier." You, you just want some sponsorships. <laughs> yeah, yeah, need, yeah, needs a better fair. filter. <laughs> I think we need to play some more games, and then maybe once we get like once we post a gameplay, a bunch of gameplay vids, and we we played a bunch of these games, and we make a tier list. Look out for it; it's coming. We're inspired by Max, so sorry to everyone who doesn't make it into S or A tier. All right, man. I'm sorry. This has been great. Uh, we appreciate it. Can't wait to play the game. Go check out Neon Heroes 
everywhere below. Give these guys some love. The awesome 100X Club. We appreciate it. We'll talk soon. 